From very early youth, I had brooded about soldiers and war, and often I had imagined, in dreams and daydreams, the sensations attendant upon being for the first time under fire. It seemed to my youthful mind that it must be a thrilling and immense experience to hear the whistle of bullets all around, and to play at hazard from moment to moment with death and wounds. Moreover, now that I had assumed professional obligations in the matter, I thought that it might be as well to have a private rehearsal, a secluded trial trip, in order to make sure that the ordeal was not one unsuited to my temperament. Accordingly, it was to Cuba that I turned my eyes. That, Dominic, was yet again a brilliant, brilliant impression of uh, Winston Churchill. Ever, ever less comprehensible, George Churchill. <laughs> but he, if you listen to him, he is pretty incomprehensible. <laughs> so for this, I did actually bother to listen to how he yeah. spoke rather than just you know, this kind of fantasy impression, which I'd done before. And actually, he is quite pretty incomprehensible and he has a speech impediment. And yes, so of I, course. I, I, yeah. I thought that was a I, I, I masterly impression there. Masterly anyway, impersonation. No, you see, you're, you, no, because you sound too clear. You sound, you sound too clear. Too uh, how, so the whole point of this, dear listeners, yeah. is that we are in part two of our survey of the early life of Winston Churchill and Dominic, in part one, we looked at his, his family background, his childhood, yeah. his education. So in 1894, in December, he passed out of Sandhurst. He'd come 20th out of his class of 150. That's not bad. And then the following month, 24th of January, 1895, his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, dies. And we talked in part one about how Churchill hero worshipped his father, but how his father was, was basically, I mean, a, a monster. I mean, a, a yeah. terrible man and a terrible parent. So in a way, do you think this is a kind of liberation for him? Or does it just intensify that, that desire to, to demonstrate his worth to the shade, the now the, 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 the departed shade of his father? That's a good question, Tom. I'm not sure. I don't, I think, I mean, that's pure amateur sort of psychology, isn't it? I think. Well, you know, I love a bit of cold psychology. I know, but I do too. Of course we all do when we, <laughs> when we look at historical figures and, and Churchill, not least. Um, I think it must have been in some sense a liberation. I mean, Churchill's not going to get any more letters from his father telling him he's a, he's a, a mere social wastrel anymore. Yeah. But on the other hand, Churchill, the, the hero worship is, of his father never lessens. I mean, if anything, it intensifies. I mean, years and years later, his friend Violet Asquith said of him, he worshipped at the altar of his unknown father. And Churchill does things like, you know, he will sort of carry his father's old bo dispatch boxes or he'll dress up in his father's old robes or he he consciously kind of copies his father's mannerisms. Um, he puts his hand on his hip in exactly the same way that his father did deliberately, wears his father's robes as Chancellor of the Exchequer, calls his son Randolph. So it's, his father is in a sense, is he liberated? I don't know. I mean, his father is in a sense always on his shoulder, I think, or this fantasy image of his father anyway, that he feels he has to, he has to live up to. Um, but that quotation that you started with, that Churchill on war, I mean, that's something that we would find, m most people now would find very unsettling. And indeed, later on, so the build up to the First World War, lots of sort of liberal politicians, Churchill was then a liberal, would say of Churchill, there was something sinister about his bloodthirstiness and his, his, you know, his fascination with war, how much he enjoys it, how much he thinks it's all a game. And I think Churchill had, to a degree that was unusual, even by the standards of the 1890s, an obsession with adventure, didn't he? I yeah. mean, he really, life to him is one long Indiana Jones but it's not. It's But it's not necessarily adventure for adventure's sake, is it? It's adventure for amplifying his fame for making a name for yeah. himself and that, that he can then leverage to to have the kind of career that he feels to engage in the cod psychologizing would impress his father yes i think that's probably I'm, I'm sure that's right and of course his mother with whom he now starts to have a much i mean they're, they're not close 
but he writes letters to his mother and his mother actually deigns to reply. <laughs> yes. So he's, well, he's financially dependent on his mother. I mean, they're both, they, they're, they're, he's, he's slightly straightened actually. They're the classic sort of aristocratic family that would appear enormously rich to yeah. their, as it were, social inferiors, but actually are struggling the whole time to keep up well, the kind of they, show they have an, that they what's need. It, they have an income of 3,000 and they spend 6,000. <laughs> yeah. <that's, laughs> you don't have to be Mr. McCorver to realize that <laughs> that's, <laughs> can generate problems. Well, Churchill is incredibly extravagant. He's always extravagant. I mean, every, anyone who knows anything about him and before he becomes prime minister knows that Clemmy, his wife, was always upbraiding him about spending ludicrous sums of money on champagne and cake and all these kinds of things. <laughs> and Churchill always says, well, you have to do it. And that's because, of course, he, he's, he's in this late Victorian Edwardian world in which ostentatious display is a crucial part of your status. Anyway, the war stuff, Churchill has this almost... It really is a kind of schoolboy's fantasy image of war. And, and the classic example of that is, as you say, to Cuba. But it's weird, isn't it? it, it it's weird because he, he, he gets, com so a month after his father dies, so in February 1895, he gets commissioned as a, uh, into the Fourth Hussars, which are very dashing, you know, all those jackets, of, all, you know, fabulous yeah. stuff. But he's not content with that because the Fourth Hussars are clearly not going to war. And so in a way that I don't entirely understand how this works, he... He parks that and goes off as a war correspondent to Cuba, where the, the, the Americans are fighting the Spanish. Well, he has a period of leave. But it seems odd that he's just got commissioned. And then he immediately, you know, a few months later, he gets leave to go off to, to be a war correspondent. I mean, it seems an odd pairing of careers. Yeah, but he's not going primarily as a war correspondent. He's going as a, as a military observer. So he's got 10 weeks leave. And most people, most of his sort of aristocratic contemporaries, will spend that time fox hunting because it's the fox hunting season. Churchill, because of that issue that you said about the funds, he doesn't have enough money to buy the horses and all the sort of stuff that he needs for that. So he's looking for something to do. And in those days, the British Army, they actually encouraged you if you were an aristocratic officer and you said, I'd like to go and have a look at a war. They said, oh, spend right. it, okay. You know, right. What, it's a bit like sort of... Um, resting football managers who say, oh, I go yeah, and spend okay. a few months with, with Barcelona to watch their training. This is basically what Church was doing. He literally looks at the sort of map and says, there's a war in Cuba. And off he goes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually not the Americans. So the Americans are yet to get involved ah, okay. in Cuba. So it's guerrillas. It's local sort of um, independence fighters who are fighting the Spanish authorities. And as you say, the war correspondence is a means to pay for this. So Churchill, and he, he basically gets it through his mum. So Jenny pays for his ticket to go to America. His father had once written for the Daily Graphic. And so Churchill basically manages to catch a deal that he will file dispatches from Cuba for the Daily Graphic. So off he goes to New York. And actually, he has an encounter in New York that's really important and not much known. So he stays with this bloke who's a, an old sort of flame or an admirer of Jenny's who's called Burke Cochran, who's now utterly unknown and forgotten. He was an American congressman who kept changing parties. He was a Democrat for a lot of the time, but then he would walk out of the Democrats and join other little parties and then come back to the Democrats. So he's a sort of, he's a real showman in kind of New York politics. And um, Churchill adores him and models himself on Burke Cochran to the extent that so even some of Churchill's most famous speeches are direct cribs from Burt Cochrane's speeches. So, for example, Burt Cochrane said of the Irish Home Rule Bill, never before in the history of the English-speaking <laughs> people has there been a victory which was so great a triumph as that attained by Mr. Gladstone. Is that's, that how he that's not how That's not how Burt Cochrane spoke, but that's how Churchill spoke. Uh, Churchill, of course, copies that line and uses it about the Battle of Britain um, later on. So yeah. he, he yeah. takes, and Churchill admits this, he'll say later on, Burt Cochrane was my model. I copied everything from him, in including flouncing in and out of political parties. But of course, Burt Cochrane is now completely forgotten, so nobody cares. And it's, it's the, and that's a kind of uh, his 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 readiness to model himself on on an American politician is also uh, expressive of his broader admiration for America, isn't it? He, he yeah, admires, he loves America. He loves the energy. He loves the uh, the pace, the vigor of it all. Um, very, very taken by it. He writes to his brother Jack and he says, picture to yourself the American people as a great lusty youth who treads on all your sensibilities, perpetuates every possible horror of ill manners, but who moves about his affairs with a good-hearted freshness, which may well be the envy of the older nations of the earth. Well, good-hearted freshness is what Churchill is all about, isn't it? I it guess. is, actually. I mean, actually, we haven't really sort of stopped for a second, but Churchill at this point, 
He's a very, very likable character, isn't he? I mean, the good-hearted freshness, even if you, I know a lot of people listen to this will maybe, maybe be Churchill skeptics and they'll roll their eyes and say, oh, surprise, surprise, kind of the British history podcasters waxing lyrical about Churchill. But I think if you read My Early Life to this point, it would be very hard to take a dislike to him because he's also so, so self-aware. He's quite self-mocking. Yeah. The fun that he had in describing all his sort of scrapes at school and stuff, and but also the sort of touching sentimentalism of the way he goes on about his parents who are such monsters. It's, it's, it's a very inimitable mix of deep and unapologetic sentimentality with a, a profound element of self-awareness. And it's a, a very peculiar mixture. And I agree, it is very, very likable. One, one might almost say lovable. Um, yeah. But with a kind of gunpowder tiggerishness about it that suggests yeah. that the whole thing may blow up at any moment um and that you know if life is an awfully great adventure so is death and cuba is i suppose so he goes to cuba so he sails from new york to cuba and he has this wonderful passage in his book my early life he says when first in the dim light of early morning i saw the shores of cuba rise and define themselves from dark blue horizons i felt as if i sailed with captain silver and first gazed on treasure island here was a place where real things were going on yeah and that that is that is a motif that runs throughout his prose isn't it the or, or indeed his comments that he will see war he will see uh, foreign cities he will see manifestations of say industrial power and he will compare it to figures from stories so treasure island in that case yeah um later on when he's in the boer war he compares the armored steam trains which will play a, a key role in his story to knights errant all that kind of thing he he, he is always painting the vivid scenes of life in the 1890s in the colours of picture books, storybooks, medieval romances, and so on. And that's clearly not an affectation. It's rising from the absolute yeah. wellsprings of everything that makes him what he is. People often said of Churchill later in life that he was terribly immature. They would sort of say that boyishness is immensely annoying and hard. To, he's impossible to work with. You know, he behaves like a he's a schoolboy trapped in a sort of in a prime minister's body. And you definitely, that schoolboyishness never, he's never ashamed of it, is he? You know, that to liken it to Treasure Island, which a lot of people would have said maybe at the time, you know, it's a children's story. Why are you, yeah. you know, have you not put aside childish things now, Churchill? And he never puts aside childish things. He has that sort of irrepressible, um, almost innocence. And it seems a, a very strange but, but, expression to but say there somebody's is a going kind off of, to watch a war. A, th there is a kind of, childishness about a lot of the writing of the British Empire at this time that you know Henty yeah. books and yeah. Ryder Haggard that imperial adventures are portrayed as as boys adventures and perhaps that's a way of I don't know not avoiding getting drawn into broader more difficult questions oh, dealing with the, ambi the moral ambiguities the moral ambiguities yeah yeah i, I mean it, it, these are the, you know this is not heart of darkness this is not or, or even some of kipling's stories of the men who would be king um mm. you know these the, these are l morally less complex narratives that perhaps avoid having to stare into the heart of darkness do you think that's maybe yeah perhaps? i think there's maybe some know. truth in that because churchill never really he does have a moral sense as we'll come to when we get to the sudan he, do, he absolutely does have a sense that you should be sporting, I suppose. But again, the way that he sees it in those terms, you could say is more of this sort of infantilization. Yeah. That play he sees up, play it up and play the game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think he, the, the, the sort of the world is an awfully big adventure. That never, ever leaves him. I mean, even the way, I suppose, if you were being very harsh, you would say even the way he talks about becoming prime minister in 1940, I was walking with destiny that this was, yeah. and, and, and he sees it as the culmination of what has been coming since he had those schoolboy fantasies. I mean, he's still the schoolboy in the boarding house talking about well, saving the empire, isn't he? We talked about that sense of destiny right at the beginning of, of part one. And perhaps before we, we, we plunge him into the, the drama and excitement of his time in Cuba. And then after that, Northwest frontier and, uh, and the Sudan, perhaps we should talk, dare I say about his, his religious 
beliefs, um, his sure, understanding I mean, of the, the, the metaphysical I, I dimension. You, you've shown tremendous self-restraint, Tom, and not um... – <laughs> Well, because because Churchill famously said he was like a buttress. He was outside the church supporting it rather than being inside. So he, he's yeah, not so really a believing. From the outside. Yeah. yeah, he's not he's not a believing Christian. Um but he does have a kind of almost pagan sense of his destiny, his genius. That he's been actually rather I mean, rather like Hitler, or perhaps, um, that both of them have this rather strange sense that they've been shaped by destiny for great things. They do believe in a God. Yeah, it's it's not the Christian God. However, the difference between Hitler and Churchill is that Churchill, in his attitude to his moral responsibilities, does seem to have a kind of you know a, a sense of empathy with the underdog. Well, the noblesse oblige that we talked about. Yes, it's it's an aristocratic sense of yeah responsibility, and of course he he also has this sense that that the British have a moral responsibility towards. The people that they rule, but perhaps Dominic, we should come to that when we should look at that okay. question and the, the kind sure. of the question of was he, of how racist was he? I think he was racist when when he goes to the northwest frontier. But for now, he's in Cuba, and he yeah. he, he claimed, didn't he, that he'd heard his first shots fired in anger on his twenty first birthday. In fact, it was the day after. That's classic Churchill. He will. He, well, I mean, I shape the narrative. Churchill. He will shape the narrative. But who doesn't? I mean, who who heard their first shots fired the day after their twenty first birthday? <laughs> yeah, not wouldn't slightly, a story. you know, smooth that story in and move them a few hours earlier. Of course, he does that. So it's the first of December, eighteen ninety five. He's been there just for a few weeks. And what and the, what he does is he he's hanging around with the Spanish kind of colonial authorities who are trying to put down this uprising that will ultimately lead to the Spanish American War. And they're just sort of riding around randomly looking for rebels in this sort of very raggedy kind of way. And uh, they're by a forest and shots ring out. The horse next to him is shot in the ribs. I mean, that would, for most people, if that yeah, happened to, you, to you or me, Tom, well, that would be the defining moment of our lives. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been talking about that forever. Yeah. The horse next to me. This for Churchill is just a, I mean, it's not even a, barely even a footnote. And he says... In my early life, I could not help reflecting that the bullet which has struck the chestnut horse had certainly passed within a foot of my head. So at any rate, I had been under fire. That was something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Here we go. So he's excited by that. He's delighted because that's what he's um, that's what he's come to see. And they sort of ride about a bit and they sort of potter around and they see people shooting in the distance. But actually, he's not really. I mean, he's there and he is an observer. So he's but- not really in the th- thick of the action. But when he comes back, so when he comes back, he gets a medal, doesn't he? He gets a medal from the Spanish, even though the actually- Red Cross of Spain. <laughs> he's sympathizing with, with the rebels, but he has to keep that quiet. But he comes back and he can know two things about himself that are going to stand him in very good stead. The first is that he is indeed brave under fire. That, yeah. You know, he, he enjoys it. So that's something to, to sort away. But also he knows that um, he's a, his mastery of English prose means that he can write incredibly well. So this is great news for his future as a war correspondent. And that will be a running theme. But also... Tight deadlines. Tight yeah, deadlines, absolutely. all that kind he of can stuff. He's a very good journalist. But also in the long run, of course, it will... You know, he, he, he can know that he can write history and all kinds of other stuff as well. So his trip to Cuba teaches him that he has these two... You know, these two yes. qualities that will serve him in very good stead th- throughout the rest of his life. Yeah. So he comes back from Cuba. Um, and as you say, he's it's all gone splendidly from that point of view. Uh, he sails with his... So he rejoins his regiment and they sail off to um, to Mumbai, to Bombay. Churchill being Churchill, he, he falls off the boat as they're docking. <laughs> and he suffers an injury that, again, with anybody else, would be a sort of life-defining injury. He falls, he dislocates his shoulder, and his shoulder from that point onwards is always... Popping being dislocated out. he's always yes. popping out exactly moment. so he can never play tennis for example the very popular game in the 1890s um he, he's desperate to play polo but he always has to play with part of his arm strapped to his body which is a huge impediment and actually it says a great deal about churchill's ability at polo that he goes on to play in all kinds of teams and win tournaments and things despite score, the fact do you score goals in polo he scores he loads scores of is it goals I mean, is know. that what you score points what? or tries or whatever you score in polo Chuckers. anyway he scores them yeah he also um, can't use a sword. He has to use a pistol. So later on in the Battle of Omdurman, um, the fact that he's got a pistol stands him in, in very good stead. Basically, because you know, if he wields a sword, his arm will fall off. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. um, so anyway, he gets to Bangalore. That's the headquarters of the Madras presidency. And a long um, way from any action. Yeah. But 
he was. Well, I mean, at that point, there's not that much action going on in India. He's just oh, North Frontier. To there's always well, the Northwest Frontier will will yeah that will come. But for the for the for the time being, he basically spends that first winter reading because he, you know, in the first podcast we talked about how Churchill um, had portrayed himself as this dunce at school, which he absolutely wasn't. But it's true that he perhaps wasn't quite as well read as he could have been. So, but with classic sort of Churchillian sort of dedication. He decides, I'm going to become incredibly well-read. So he starts off by reading Gibbon, Edward Gibbon, very much a friend of the rest of his history, I think it's fair Absolutely to say. Absolutely a friend of the rest of his history, um, yeah. And he, sit, he has this lovely description. Um, if, you, if you sort of think, oh, Churchill's greatly overrated, it's all just sort of smoke and mirrors, you read the way when Churchill, in his autobiography of my early life, he talks about reading Gibbon all through the long glistening middle hours of the Indian day from when we quitted stables till the evening shadows proclaimed the hour of polo. I devoured Gibbon. I rode triumphantly through it from end to end and I enjoyed it all. And that sort of, he, he absorbs, I think Gibbon's sense of irony when he talks about history, his sense of sweep and character, his sense that this is a tremendously enjoyable melodrama. And, and the fact that an English sentence is a noble thing. Yeah. That you can do incredible things with English prose. Yeah, it's Gibbon and Macaulay. So Macaulay is his other great um his other great love. He's gutted that Macaulay doesn't think much of the Duke of Marlborough. And I was grieved to read his harsh judgments and uh uh, but then he's he's funny about Macaulay. He says, there was no one to tell me that this historian with his captivating style and devastating self-confidence was the prince of literary rogues who always preferred the tale to the truth and <laughs> smirched or glorified great men and garbled documents according to how they affected his drama. Nobody would ever say that of this podcast, Tom. Would no, they? of course not. Not not ever. Uh, but my, my favorite thing about <laughs> Churchill's kind of autodidacticism where he's just hoovering up all this stuff that he clearly hadn't read at Harrow is that he reads Aristotle and he reads Aristotle's ethics <laughs> and he says you know it's very good but it's extraordinary how much of it I had already thought out for myself <laughs> which is, um, that's what I always think about Greek philosophy there Tom yeah. I mean you it's know, did it not occur to you when you were 10 yeah, yeah self-explanatory <laughs> all this sort of stuff there is a certain harshness perhaps to Aristotle's ethics that you could see might appeal to Churchill yeah so Aristotle, I mean, Aristotle uh, notoriously defined, you know, separated the world into Greeks and barbarians. Uh, yeah. And he essentially said that Greeks had the right to rule barbarians. Uh, and, and so perhaps that's something that went with the grain of Churchill's thinking. There are people out in the empire who have doubts about it, who are troubled by the assumption of racial superiority. Churchill doesn't. Well, it's, I mean, that is a, a Christian impetus, isn't it? Yeah. Essentially. I mean, if all men are created equally in the image of God, then they're equal. But Churchill has a, has a, a, a more racist sense of there being that hum, humans are different racially. See, I don't. I think the word racist there is really I, I, is it unhelpful or misleading? Maybe a bit of both, because we use it. Uh, it's a to describe a lot of very different things. So there's a kind of racial prejudice which is, as it were, hateful, which is shot through with resentment and bitterness and sort of a sense of um, a really sort of horrible sort of sense of disgust and all these kinds of things. I don't think Churchill has that at all. He undoubtedly has something slightly different, I would say, which is an unwavering sense of superiority. He doesn't think that other races are horrible or, or disgusting or brutish or these kind of, he's actually often quite interested in in them but he just thinks the british are the best and he loves the empire it would never occur to him to question the empire the empire is his creed his his mission and the way he thinks about it we talked about his sort of childishness is a little bit like how a child thinks of don't you think yeah okay i do but i also think that it is and this may be kind of mediated through, but I think it's reflective of the Darwinian spirit of the age that yeah. for the first time has been able to provide a kind of scientific rationale for the gut prejudice that imperial peoples have always had, that somehow they have won a great empire because they're the best. I mean, there, you know, there has never been an imperial people who didn't think that they were the best because they look, you know, they, they look around at their own greatness relative to the people that they rule and say, well, of course we're best. That's, that's, that's self-evident. What Darwinism does is to provide what seems to be a scientific explanation for it. Essentially, that 
different races have evolved at different speeds and therefore yeah. some are better than others. And I think that Churchill, I mean, whether he's read Darwin or not, I don't know. Maybe he's, Darwin is part of his reading in Bangalore. I can't Bangalore. remember. Yeah. But I think that he just has that kind of instinctive assumption. Look around yeah, I think at that's the, the might and splendor of the empire. Of course we're better. But it's rather like you know him looking after his nanny he or kept, you know tipping i don't know the porter or whatever it the british are to other races in churchill's opinion as the british aristocracy are to the vast mass of the british people yeah that's a good comparison that they have privilege but they also have responsibility and i guess that that would be the difference between churchill and hitler say that hitler's hitler's understanding of race is predatory and aggressive and he sees it as a war between constant war between races. Churchill kind of assumes that, well, you know, maybe they'd make rather good Batman, <laughs> I guess yeah. would be the difference. Do you think? Yeah, I think that's very fair, Tom. I think he has a, a strong sense of noblesse oblige. I think he has a sense of paternalism. Some listeners may say, and, and, and they're not necessarily wrong, that they find the sense of superiority completely overwhelmingly off-putting. I suppose you would say if you were, I mean, I think actually the sort of attack defense way of talking about people from the past is pointless anyway, but let's, let's indulge it for a second. In his defense, you would say, um, it's very common, you know, m most, probably most Britons at the time, like most Frenchmen or indeed Belgians or Germans or whatever, Dutchmen shared Japanese. this, yeah, shared this sense of, um, I had this sort of sense of superiority, but it's impossible. It, I mean, it, basically, it's impossible to rule an empire and not have that sense of superiority instilled in the upper classes, because otherwise, yeah, you know, empires are by definition the things of smoke and mirrors. Where he tends to be aggressive, though, Tom, I think is when that is threatened. So, in other words, when people challenge the empire, I mean, Gandhi is the most famous example in the interwar years. Churchill will often, and he always reaches for the most emotive, extreme, aggressive rhetoric, because that's his, that's almost the skill he's learned as a journalist, isn't it? He always yeah. goes over the top in every speech, every article to go over the top is Churchill's kind of literary instinct. And so that's why I think you often end up with him saying things that are designed to shock or to make people laugh at the time or to make them write, you know, sort of almost that sort of tabloid style. I think that probably actually belies him to an extent, because I think deep down, and maybe some listeners will say, oh, this is just special pleading. I don't know. I think deep down, he is more good natured than some of his more sort of aggressive put downs would lead you to believe. Uh, yes. I, I mean, he always reaches for the emotive language of, uh, dare I say, a brilliant columnist in a best selling <laughs> British tabloid. Right. But of course, you know, his greatest moment is where the force of that language meets with an object that merits that language. So the, the force yeah. of his rhetoric when he's talking about Hitler and the Nazis, it's equal to, you know, it, it, it has the power that is able to express the scale of the evil that is being confronted. Obviously, when he's applying it to Gandhi, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's- Well, of course, he'd seemed ludicrous in the 1930s for precisely that reason, because in yeah. the interwar years, Churchill had used this incredibly archaic children's storybook kind of language yeah crossed with the tabloid newspaper very aggressive very sort of almost cod arthurian and people had just thought he was a joke been talking yeah. about ind independence in this way but as you say when he then th that archaic style proves perfect for rallying the nation in 1940 in a way that it didn't talk about complicated issues in the 1930s anyway dominic we, we we're not talking about church yeah we've, we've got completely we've gone a, yeah. off. we're not talking about churchill in the 30s and 40s we're talking about young churchill um, we take a so break, he Tom. is now in india we should take a break when we come back we will look at um his engagement in two classic imperial adventures um uh, a, a, a war on the northwest frontier and um his journey with Kitchener to Khartoum. So uh, we will be discussing that after the break. We'll see you when we come back. Bye-bye. Welcome back to The Rest is History. We are in the middle of the life, the, the early life of Winston Churchill. Uh, Tom, the Indian Northwestern frontier and Sabindan blood. So it's Sabindan the most blood. brilliant it's, name, isn't it? Yeah, for a I mean, British Churchill imperialist. would have a. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen a picture of him? No, I haven't. He's How brilliant. He he's everything that you would expect with a name like Sabindan Blood. 
the, the scale of his moustache is it's the most imperial looking moustache you have ever seen i highly recommend any listen anyone listening to this go and um look up go and google sir bindon blood and you will not be disappointed at what that's you find. excellent news so sir bindon but blood you know, he is died aged 98 in 1940 1940 wow yeah, so very, That's impressive. very long old. So Sir Minden Blood was the descendant of the Colonel Blood who stole the crown jewels. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an uncommon name, isn't it? <laughs> it is blood. Anyway, um, Sir Bindon Blood um, is a commander up in um, northwestern India. He's, again, yet another crony of Churchill's mother and their sort of posh friends. And Churchill has basically extracted from him a promise that if ever there's a rebellion on the northwest frontier and Sir Bindon Blood has to put it down, he will let Churchill come with him. Surprise, surprise. In August 1897, Churchill hears that the, the Pashtuns have indeed risen on the, in the, in the incredibly sort of remote valleys on the northwestern frontier of, of India. So that's what's now Pakistan, Pakistan sort of Afghan border, I suppose. And Sabindam, Churchill immediately asks Sabindam Blood if he can come. At first, Sabindam Blood struggles to find a place for him. Churchill gets a job as a war correspondent again. So he's taking leave from his regiment, hasn't he? From his regiment. His mother yeah. yet again pulls some strings and arranges that some of his letters from the, the front will be published in the Daily Telegraph. They'll pay him five pounds a time, which is good money in those days. And off goes Churchill to the northwest frontier to serve with Sabindam Blood and the 12,000 strong Malakand field force. So they're basically... They're, they're, it's a punitive expedition to deal with these tribes that have been sort of robbing villages and just sort of, and Church, as Churchill would no doubt say, making a nuisance of themselves. Yeah. Um, and he, in classic Churchill style, he describes the whole thing as this sort of most tremendous laugh, doesn't yeah. he? So yeah. he says at one point, they go with all these political officers, and the political officers are constantly trying to sort of do deals with the tribesmen. And, none, and Churchill and his pals are aghast at this behavior because they just want to have a huge fight. And to his delight, they do have a fight. He says it was all very exciting. And for those who did not get killed or hurt, very <laughs> jolly. <laughs> well, and this yeah. is so a lot of people were killed and on our side, their widows have had to be pensioned by the Imperial government and others were badly wounded and hopped around for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he thinks the whole thing is the most tremendous fun. Like most young fools, I was looking for trouble, and I hoped that something exciting would happen. It did! <laughs> Big exclamation mark. Yeah. But he. But the funny thing about Churchill, when he describes this, because the passages in his book about... I mean, this is a, a, a tiny war by British imperial standards. It's barely even a war. It's just a sort of raid, a, a raid and the repression of a raid. The funny thing is that on the one hand, he talks about it in this sort of this enjoyable skirmish crackled away, you know, this great, great, great fun. And yet at the same time, he would say a few lines later, he will say one man was shot through the breast and pouring with blood. Another lay on his back, kicking and twisting. The British officer was spinning around just behind me, his face a mass of blood, his right eye cut out. Yes, it was certainly an adventure. And, and at the end of the cat, whether it was worth it, I cannot tell. At any rate, at the end of a fortnight, the valley was a desert and honor was satisfied. Uh, you know, and that leaving, there's an echo of Tacitus there, the idea that, yeah. you know, they created a desert, desert and called it peace. Call it peace. Um, yeah, and he says at the beginning, he says that he doesn't he actually think the British, you know, should have even bothered with all this. That um, he feels sorry for the the tribesmen of the northwest frontier. He kind of admires them. He doesn't think they should have been punished. So he has this weird. There's this strange ambiguity that reminds me, and this is such a peculiar comparison. It reminds me a tiny bit of the Flashman novels. So in the Flashman novels, Flashman, there's part of him that is, is always frightened and you know running away, which Churchill never does. That, but there's part of him that loves all these adventures and loves the kind of romance of it. And yet at the same time, he's aware of the sort of hypocrisies and the moral yeah. ambiguity of what he's doing. And there's a little bit of a sense of that, I think, with Churchill, that he knows that there's part of him that knows that this is horrible, that people are being horribly injured and killed. He writes about it in this comical way, but the humor of it derives from the fact that people have died or been maimed. Yeah. yeah. And I think, but also there is, there is a kind of Darwinian sense that this is just what's what the strong do just, the way life and is. yet at the same time he'll say that you know his friend lieutenant william brown clayton was literally cut to pieces on a stretcher and he says to write to his mother he says he cried you know churchill cried as he saw his friend so it's not that he's unfeeling it's that maybe he just thinks the world is a place where 
Well, I think his response is operating on many levels, isn't it? So there's the sentimentality that we've talked about, the and the, the ability to feel grief. Sentimental is perhaps an unfair word. Ability to feel grief very, very deeply. A, a sense of excitement. This is all tremendous fun. A Darwinian sense that it's just the way that the world is. It always has been. It always will be. And perhaps uh, a, a, a slight ache that that the British are not behaving better than they are behaving. Uh, and I yeah. think that... The evidence for that is in his response to what happens in his next adventure, which is uh, the Sudan War. So this really is the imperial adventure to end all imperial adventures. So regular listeners will have listened to our podcast about General Gordon and his adventures in the Sudan, which had ended, I think it's fair to say, very badly yes. with General Gordon being killed in the residency in, in Khartoum by the insurgent kind of Islamist army of the Mahdi, um, who was this sort of self-appointed messiah who had led the the people of the Sudan in this tremendous uprising against Egypt and against Egypt's kind of imperial sponsor, Britain. So Gordon had been killed in 1885, and that had left a tremendous impression on the British public. I mean, it really was the kind of the running sore, the, uh, the terrible defeat that must be avenged. And there was ever since that, for more than 10 years, there had been this thirst for a final settling of accounts. Not with the Mahdi, because the Mahdi had died, but with his successor, who was called the Khalifa, um, who ruled what is now Sudan and South Sudan and sort of bits of Ethiopia. And basically, in 1898, this came to a head. Um, the great imperial hero, to the Victorians anyway, Sir Herbert Kitchener, is leading this force of 20,000 men south. I mean, this app, you know, it's the, it's the sort of paradigmatic imperial adventure. And once again, Churchill hears that it's happening and is desperate to go tries to get his mother to pull strings. He tries to get Lord Salisbury, the prime minister, to pull strings. Kitchener doesn't want him there. Um, and they, they have a feud that lasts for the rest of their lives. And it's at this point in his book, I love this, this passage, Tom. Churchill keeps applying to go, and people keep blocking him. Because clearly at this stage, he's already got a reputation yeah. as just this sort of bumptious uh, toe rag. Metal hunter. A metal hunter. He says, I now perceived that there were many ill-informed and ill-disposed people who did not take a favorable view of my activities. Uh, uh, what does he say? Uh, the expression is metal hunter and self-advertiser were used from time to time in some high and low military circles in a manner which would, I am sure, surprise and pain the readers of these notes. Astonished. He says, he says by, by a most curious and indeed unaccountable coincidence, <laughs> similar accusations have always presented themselves in the wake of my innocent footsteps. And I think that's one of the things about Churchill's lovability. He knows that he's an attention seeker and yeah. terribly bumptious and stuff. Yeah. And he's funny about the fact that other people are, I think yeah. it's the sense of humor, he's, the fact that he's able to be funny about himself that makes him more endearing than he might otherwise, um, than he might otherwise be. But anyway, he gets it, doesn't he? He pulls, he pulls his strings, and he's yeah. off to, he's off to, off to the Sudan. As is the, um, as is classic Churchill, he, he's also writing a column at the time. So he's going to write for the Morning Post, fifteen pounds per column, three times what he was paid in India. Uh, he has dinner before he goes with the head of the Psychical Research <laughs> yes. Society, and they, they make him to promise him. to, to that do. if he's killed, he will communicate <laughs> yeah. with them from the death. <laughs> I would imagine. Um, Churchill is a So ghost. off he goes. And actually, if you ever doubted that Churchill was a wonderful writer, because, of course, his great Second World War books, you know, there was an enormous, enormous number of collaborators with him on that. And that sort of suspicion that there's an awful lot of ghostwriting hung over his subsequent Nobel Prize for Literature. But his, the way he – his descriptions of the lead-up to the Battle of Omdurman are incredibly evocative. So he goes across the desert from Cairo. I mean, a classic Churchill, he – gets lost in the desert. He spends a night without food and water and has to wander for 70 miles before he rediscovers the convoy. But again, that's barely even... That yeah. happens in sort of I half mean, a would, sentence. Uh, yeah, as you say, I mean, if we did that, that would be the... We'd never forget it. You'd never talk of anything else if that no. happened to you. That sort of happens to him just fleetingly on the way. Yeah. They arrive, the Anglo-Egyptian army have almost reached Khartoum. They're in this place called Omdurman. Uh, there's 25,000 of them. There's a colossal army of what are called the dervishes. So this is the Khalifa's men, the sort of the Islamist kind of tribesmen who are, you know, they, there's a massive disparity, one of the great disparities ever in terms of technology and weaponry. Because we have got the Gatling gun yeah. and they have not. 
Well, it's a Maxim, I think, at Omdurman, the machine guns. And I think there are 50 of them. The, um, the dervishes obviously think this will be a classic battle in which they will sort of, you know, ride into action and wave their swords and rifles will sing out. And they're not really prepared for the machine guns. Industrial slaughter. Industrial slaughter. I mean, Churchill, the way he describes this, you know, nothing like the Battle of Omdurman will ever be seen again. It was the last link in the long chain of those spectacular conflicts whose vivid and majestic splendor who's done so much to invest war with glamour. So on the one hand, he sees this as the ultimate. I mean, this is the culmination. This is really talking about that sense of destiny. This is the moment he has dreamed of. Yeah, since he was a boy, because he's in the. And cavalry. as you say, his prose is so over over all the immense dome of the sky, done to turquoise, turquoise to deepest blue, pierced by the flaming sun, weighed hard and heavy on marching necks and shoulders. I mean, it's so good. Yeah, it's so it's, a, it's fantastically readable. This sort of sense, he absolutely has a sense that this is a moment of supreme imperial melodrama that he's been dreaming of since. And he was a moment a boy. of history, isn't it? Because he recognizes a of history. that. Cavalry charges and men with spears, and you know this is an ancient, ancient story that perhaps is this is the last manifestation of it. It's the last and, time and it'll so ever happen. Yeah. And he's really conscious of that. He, um, I forgot to mention, he's travelled with all the champagne, and he has a load of champagne with uh, an officer commanding a gunboat called Lieutenant David Beatty. And Beatty is going to be one of the key pe- people in the First World War, the Battle of Jutland. So again, one of these characters who will then pop it up, pops up, yeah, later on. But the dawn rises on the 2nd of September, 1898, and Churchill has this fantastic lyrical description of the dawn and the sense of tension and uh, the, the sun rising over the desert. And he hears the noise of people coming towards him. He says, what is this sound which we hear? A deadened roar coming up to us in waves. They are cheering for God, his prophet, and his holy Khalifa. They think they are going to win. Talk of fun. Where will you beat this? I mean, that's obviously not what a lot of the British soldiers must have been thinking. Yeah, not thinking. They must have been yeah. absolutely terrified. Yeah. And then there's this moment of, I mean, it really is the sort of the textbook clash of ancient and modern, where he and his, they ride into, the guns are singing out, the machine guns are beginning to rattle, but Churchill and the 21st Lancers launch this charge, the largest British cavalry charge since the Crimea, really the last great cavalry charge in all British history. Churchill has a troop of 25 men. He's on this um, Arab pony. He's got his, um, because he can't, because of his arm, he's got his pistol, his Mauser, and they ride down into this water course, and there are sort of dervishes looming up out of the scrub, and he is firing away with his revolver and men are falling all around him this kind of swords flashing it is the most incredible swashbuckling scene but in due course when he when he looks at the industrial scale of the slaughter and the disparity he pays due tribute to the courage of the men that that the british have been fighting yeah so he says yeah. discipline and machinery triumphed over the most desperate valor and after an enormous carnage, certainly exceeding 20,000 men who strewed the ground in heaps and swathes like snowdrifts, the whole mass of the dervishes dissolved into fragments and into particles and streamed away into the fantastic mirages of the desert. These were as brave men as ever walked the earth, destroyed, not conquered by machinery. So this is not a kind of, he's not exulting in the slaughter. The battle is one of the high points, probably the high point of his life. Um, the moment he's been dreaming of, the exhilaration and the adrenaline of the cavalry charge. And he loves fighting the dervishes, but he sees them as noble, admirable even, adversaries who've been cut down by machinery. And he feels very conflicted about that. And he specifically, he, he, it does, Kitchener's victory does nothing to reconcile Churchill to Kitchener as a, no, as a moral figure. He despises Kitchener. Kitchener is a very austere man and the sort of... Um, Kitchener is your sort of exhibit A in your sort of unsmiling, pith-helmeted, deeply repressed sort of British imperial officer, isn't he? Sort of strange associations with young boys, uh, utterly unsparing, no mercy. And, and with a, street, a, a real streak of cruelty, I think. Would you, well, so would Kitchener orders that the Mardi's tomb, because the Mardi's already be dead, that the Mardi's tomb in revenge for General Gordon, the Mardi's tomb is desecrated and is, is blown up. Uh, but he then he demands that the Mahdi's head is is saved, and he um, keeps it in a kerosene tin 
Although Churchill says he pretended to have it in a kerosene tin, but the tin may have contained anything, perhaps ham sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> in very Churchillian detail. But Churchill is outraged by this. He thinks it's incredibly unsporting. He's also outraged by the treatment of captured dervishes after the battle. So this is the classic example of Churchill's sort of sense of that everything is a game. and, and But because it's a game, because it's a sporting encounter, you shake hands afterwards. So he says afterwards that he has seen people um killing dervish prisoners after the battle he writes to his cousin the duke of marlborough the general callousness which he kitchener has repeatedly exhibited has disgusted me i have seen acts of great barbarity perpetuated at omdurman and i've been thoroughly sickened of human blood i shall always be glad that i was one of those who took these brave men on with weapons little better than theirs and with only our discipline to back against their numbers all the rest of the army merely fed out death by machinery yeah and he calls kitchener utterly callous um yeah which i think He's, is a very fair description yeah well i mean kitchener was kitchener was ruthless uh, as kitchener, we will see when we come to the Boer war yeah, Kitchener was absolutely ruthless and said, I've got a job to do, I'm going to do it, and that's to kill as many dervishes as possible. Churchill is horrified by that, because if you have this sense that everything is Treasure Island and everything is King Solomon's mines, then, as it were, the sort of what you might see as one of the more admirable sides of that, because, of course, there are less admirable sides, but one of the more admirable sides is you think of your opponents as jolly, brave. You you almost romanticise, sentimentalise your adversaries, which Churchill definitely well, did. Well, Churchill's harrowed, the they would be eaten. Yeah, that's how he thinks. <laughs> that's how he thinks it. Yeah. Um, so on the way home, one nice detail that I thought you would appreciate, I'm sorry that you haven't brought it up yourself, is that Churchill makes friends with the most brilliant man in journalism I have ever met, who is the star writer of a new newspaper. You know the newspaper in question, Tom? Uh, you do know, think, you just don't want to say. You just I don't want to say. I can't so, uh, he Would it be the he Daily Mail? He write, makes friends with G.W. Stevens, the star writer of uh, Her Majesty's, as it then was, Daily Mail. Um, he, Churchill lends him a piece of paper so that Stevens can write a dispatch about the war for the readers of the mail. And when Churchill comes down, he says, I found that all he'd written on my nice sheet of paper was pop, 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 <laughs> pop, bang. And well, Churchill was disgusted that, at this. That's the Daily but Mail. But then he it. says... Tom, and I, uh, he says, uh, <laughs> Stevens had many other styles besides that of the jaunty, breezy, slapdash productions, which he wrote for the Daily Mail. He, he, he finds that Stevens has written an enormous article about the future of the British Empire, in which he, he has been credited as the new Gibbon. Wow. Well, can, can you imagine of that? Think of that. That kind of thing would never happen now. Ah, oh, historian writing in a slapdash way, but also being the new Gibbon. Can't think. No, Can't I think. couldn't imagine you would. So, Dominic, yes, that's a very important detail. I'm glad you got that yeah, in. Yeah, very but, important. Um, but I think this is probably a good note on which to end because essentially, you know, the narrative of um, of the Sudan War is effortless British superiority, essentially, military superiority. Uh, the assumption that they can go to war, that they can use their industrial heft, their military prowess, essentially to pulverise anyone who opposes them, throw their weight around, do what they like, and this is imperialism really not as an adventure, but as something altogether more predatory and murderous. It's a juggernaut, and I suppose. A juggernaut. And the final stage of, let's call it Young Churchill, th this sequence of adventures uh, in various imperial wars, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover in part three. And, and that's the most extraordinary story of all. And that's the most extraordinary story of all. And it's, it's basically, it, it's a war that is a huge embarrassment to Britain. Britain behaves very badly. I mean, people may think Britain's already this behaving very, this badly. This is very harsh, Tom. I don't agree with that. It behaves, behaves very badly. Fake news. Uh, Dominic, no, Dominic, Britain does behave very, very badly in South Africa and behaves very poorly. And there is a point in the Boer War where almost the only good news that the British are getting is provided by Winston Churchill, who has been taken prisoner and then escapes one of the most dramatic yeah. uh, episodes of Daring Do in British imperial history. And that will be the subject of our of episode podcast. tomorrow. But so, before that, to cleanse people's palates after that shockingly unpatriotic ending from Tom Holland, I think we should have a bit of poetry, Tom. We haven't had any poetry okay, yes, in these episodes. Poetry. Now, regular listeners to The Rest is History will know that we are great admirers of the, of the poetry of William McGonagall, 
the world's worst poet, who, of course, wrote a poem about the Tay Bridge disaster, which we read out on this podcast, and I think also wrote a poem, didn't he, about the death of General Gordon, Tom? He did. We, we quoted him for that. So I think I would like to read what uh, McGonagall had to say about the Battle of Omdurman, because this is beautiful poetry. It was the year of 1898, and on the 2nd of September, which the Khalifa and his surviving followers will long remember... <laughs> because Sir Herbert Kitchener has annihilated them outright by the British troops and Sudanese in the Omdurman fight. The chief heroes in this fight were the 21st Lancers. They made a brilliant charge on the enemy with ringing cheers, and through the dusky warriors' bodies their lances they did thrust, whereby many of them were made to lick the dust. And when the Khalifa saw his noble army cut down, with rage and grief he did fret and frown. Then he spurred his noble steed, and swiftly it ran, while inwardly to himself he cried, Catch me if you can! <laughs> and Mardism now has received a crushing blow, for the Khalifa and his followers have met with a complete overthrow, and General Gordon has been avenged, the good Christian, by the defeat of the Khalifa at the Battle of Omdurman. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>